One of the things that economists have focused on sort of off and on throughout the history of economics is the role of institutions. And often when we think about the word institutions, we think about things like, you know, the Federal Reserve or the Justice Department. Um, and those are definitely part of what we mean by institutions, but uh, certainly not the only thing. By institutions, what we really mean is what are the rules of the game? What are all of the laws, uh, norms that affect how economic actors can uh, do their business? So that includes workers, it includes firms, it includes government. How, what are the rules that say how those people can interact and often more specifically, how can they not interact? Um, and the institutions of an economy can be really important. And so we can see that, you know, similar countries uh, that have different institutions can have very different outcomes. Um, and that's one of the things that we're going to talk about here in chapter five. In chapters one and two, what we really talked about uh, was how the economic pie has grown over the last 200 years. Um, and so that means that, you know, we produce a lot more per hour worked. We have a lot of technologies that we didn't have before. We have a lot of capital that we didn't have before. And all of that has allowed us to consume a lot more than we did 200 years ago. Uh, chapter five is going to be a little bit more about how that economic pie that's been growing gets divided and so how those allocations are determined. And so do workers get more? Do uh, employers get more? Do landlords get more? Do renters get more? Uh, all of this is really important and something that sometimes gets uh, ignored, especially in an introductory economics class. And what we'll talk about is both a Pareto efficiency condition, which basically just means that we're not wasting anything. Uh, and, but also we'll think about fairness, right? Fairness is a little bit more complicated than efficiency, uh, but can be in some cases even more important. And then we'll show how some policies can improve outcomes, whether that means that we can make outcomes more Pareto efficient or more fair, keeping in mind that people might disagree about how uh, fairness should be judged. So Pareto efficiency is the idea that uh, if something is Pareto efficient, we can't make one person better off without making somebody else worse off. And so there can be lots of Pareto efficient outcomes. But let's go back to our example uh, of Anil and Bala using the uh, integrated pest control versus the Terminator. And remember that the Terminator Terminator was the Nash equilibrium for this uh, prisoner's dilemma type game, right? And we ended up here where they both got two. And that sort of struck us as wrong, right? Because there was an outcome uh, in which they both got three, which would be better, right? And so what we can say here is that the, the outcome where they both use integrated pest control so I, I here, where they both get three, Pareto dominates the uh, outcome where they both use Terminator. And so in that case, uh, we would like to be in a position where we can put in some uh, rules and regulations that say, okay, you both have to use integrated pest control, um, and we can end up at this more Pareto efficient outcome, I, I, than TT. Why is it Pareto efficient? because both of them get made better off, right? And so TT is dominated by II. Now here's a one thing to notice, right? Our outcomes IT and TI, where one of them gets four and the other gets one, are also both Pareto efficient. They are not Pareto dominated by any other outcome. Because if we move from four one to three three, for example, then Bala actually gets less, uh, even though Anil gets more. And so in any uh, outcome, where somebody gets less but another person gets more, that's not Pareto efficient, right? It might be fair. We have to decide that because we have to decide what fair means, uh, but it's not going to be Pareto efficient. And so one of the things that's important to keep in mind is that Pareto efficiency is in some ways a very weak requirement for outcomes. If I have $100 and you have nothing, that can be a Pareto efficient outcome, right? Because in order for me to give you anything, then that makes me worse off. So if I give you one cent or one dollar, then you're better off, but I'm worse off. And so moving from 100 zero to 99 one is 
not Pareto efficient, right? Even though it might feel more fair. Um, and so the Pareto criterion doesn't necessarily help us choose between outcomes, right? If our three outcomes are, uh, you know, 4, 1, 3, 3, and 1, 4, then how do we decide what to do, right? Anil would prefer 4, 1 if he's being completely selfish. Bala would prefer uh, 1, 4 if Bala's being completely selfish. But, you know, if an outside observer might say, oh, well, no, 3, 3 would be better. And so those are all three are Pareto efficient outcomes, and we have to decide which one we actually prefer. So sometimes we need to think about fairness, right? Fairness is not something that economics usually talks about because there can be lots of different uh, fair outcomes, right? It could be fair that we everybody gets the same. It could be fair that people get what they work for. It could be fair that you know, some people, you know, everybody gets enough to eat even if uh, people don't, won't get rich if they don't work, right? There's lots of different ways to think about fair. Um, and the rules of the game, the institutions will often influence uh, the outcome and so determine whether or not those outcomes are fair. And we as a society have to decide, you know, what we want those rules to be in order to influence those outcomes. And so we can think about two different uh, ways to think about fairness. One is a substantive judgment of fairness. And the substantive judgment is really all about outcome, right? So how much income people do, do people get? How much wealth do people have? What is their well-being? Is everybody have the same amount of health and wealth and income? Uh, or is it uh, unequal, right? And so that's one way to think about it, just how do, where do people end up? In the United States, what we often focus more on is the procedural judgment of fairness, right? And that's the idea of whether or not people have equality of opportunity, right? Where did everybody get to start at the same place? Did everybody get uh, an equal education when they were children? Do they have equal access to housing and to jobs and to loans, right? Things like that. And in the United States, what we've often focused on is making sure that, or often anyway, making sure that people have more equal opportunity of, uh, you know, beginnings than of endings. Um, and so we often say, all right, well, there's going to be some inequality, uh, but really what we need to make sure is that everybody has the same opportunities. Uh, and I think that's something to think about because, you know, if everybody has the same opportunities, but some people end up dying, starving on the street, is that really the outcome we want? And maybe there's some balance between a uh, procedural judgment of fairness and a substantive judgment of fairness. And that was really Rawls's point. So John Rawls was a philosopher uh, in the 20th century, and his uh, idea was that uh, we should decide on the rules of the game behind what he called a veil of ignorance, meaning we don't get to know where we're going to end up in society and so we should choose the uh, institutions, the rules, the laws uh, that we think will be best, you know, with the idea that we have an equal chance of ending up at the bottom or at the top. And what he recommended uh, was making sure that the worst off in society were as well off as possible. And he did not think that sort of a, a communist, everybody gets an equal share was a good outcome because he thought that would actually make people poorer and make the very worst off worse off. Um, but some sort of capitalist uh, system with, you know, a strong social safety net to catch anybody who just didn't do well in the capitalist system. So making sure that people, you know, didn't starve, had a place to live, uh, had health care, things like that. So that was his solution. So as we said, economics often doesn't talk about what is fair and what is not fair. And some economists don't like to talk about how the pie gets uh, divided at all, rather focusing on things that can grow the pie. Um, but I think what we've seen over the last 40 years is that the institutions uh, in the United States have played a very important role uh, in changing how that pie gets divided. Um, and so things like, you know, right to work laws in states have uh, reduced the power of unions. Uh, private sector unions have fallen below 10 percent. And so we have a lot more inequality of income uh, than we used to. 
Um, and, you know, that's meant that, you know, there's been an increasing focus on how these institutions affect inequality um, and which public policies can be used to un uh, address things that might not be fair, um, you know, things like a higher minimum wage, things like supporting unions, things like national health care, um, and what we want to give up for them, you know, and how much they would cost.